All right, Shalom, Shabbat, Shalom, send that Shalom. All right, so we're going to touch on Aser, Aser, Osar, Osiris, and we're still in the RSS, the Rastafari Sabbatical Study number 38, Korach, or Kore, Kore, Kor, Jude 11. Jude 11. Now, what we so far have discovered is very interesting how when Revelation speaks about these um, three unclean spirits, right, that come out of the, in the mouth of the false prophet, and, and these three right here, Cain, the way of Cain, the era of Balaam, and the gainsaying of Kore. And this is what we want to continue to um, address in this Torah portion. Now, the Torah portion right here from the book of um, Numbers, or in the Hebrew, Be-Ibrayist, um, Be-Midbar, is, uh, the Torah portion is Numbers 16 to Numbers 18.32. Now, we haven't even gotten into the particulars of the rebellion or the incident in this particular sabbatical study. However, what's very interesting is that just by studying the name and the metaphysical um, um, Bible dictionary and getting into what does the name mean, not only do we understand the context of what happened, but also what I like to call the Rastafari, the Kabbalah or the Kebele. The word Kebele means to receive. Some may interpret that to take in that sense. In other words, what, do, what are you able to receive? When Christ says, um, those who are able to receive it, let it be so, to ones who can receive it. You know, um, those who hear the Spirit, those who can receive it, those who have receptivity to it, of course will overstand it, as you would say, a little bit um, uh, deeper or in a more personal, individual consciousness application. And this is what the overstand, this is what when we speak about I and I. You overstand the individual, there's an individual responsibility to study and show themselves approved. And this is what we're seeking to do in this particular portion. And this is be the third um, part of this um, RSS number 38 for 2012, for 2012. Now, we are left off on Asir, because in looking up Korach um, in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, at a certain point it said to see Asir. Now, we notice that Asir, Asir and the link of Osar is very interesting, linguistically speaking, or one who is called Osiris. So this particular portion of this Torah portion reading, um, this teaching, this Devar, this speaking of the Torah, um, this Orita Neger, the matter concerning Neger, um, Orit, is going to concern Asir and the Osar, Osiris, connection to Korah. Now, remember, Korah, was one of the three rebels. That means that there are at least two other names that we should, and for the, for the students and the disciples, there's two other names associated that, that also need to be understood in their proper context, right? Remember the name, the name, what's in the name? You know, people, places, ideas, I mean, Names are very, very important. This is why um, we have Yaakov, our ancestor, Jacob, asking the angel, what is your name? So the name is very, very important. So we're studying the names right here in this Torah portion, and we're studying it metaphysically. Now we're going to get the Rastafari, the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, the, the original Ethiopic overstanding, our Ethiopian Hebrew overstanding of this. Now, there's Datan and Abiram. We haven't touched on Datan, Datan and or Datan, Datan and Abiram as of yet. All right. We haven't even touched on the particulars of the rebellion, which are very interesting. All we're touching on right now is the name. 
and now we're going to touch on Asir. Asir. So here, Asir, because this is what, what, what the reference in the metaphysical said, see, Asir. So we're going to check out Asir. But even before we saw that there, we saw that um, the story of Korah, where the earth opens up, sounded very familiar to I and I from Egypt. But then again, Moses, Moshe, he was, he was learned in the wisdom of the Egypts, and he was mighty in word and deed. So he was initiated within this, within this um, metaphysical or mythological, you understand, this, this, this particular orientation, the true Hebraic orientation, needs to be understood out of Egypt but rooted in Ethiopia. Thus we have Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, a Medeanite or an Ethiopian, Moses' wife, as well as Zipporah, also an Ethiopian. So that Ethiopian-Hebrew connection should be very obvious. All right? Now, Aser here, from the Hebrew, means captive. Aser here means prisoner. Now, it says a Levite, a son of Korah, so this is one of the sons of Korah, according to Exodus 6 and 24. According to Exodus 6 and 24. And what we, what we would like to do right now is just go to Exodus, according to the Mets of Caduce, His Majesty's Book of the Seven Seals, to look at, in the Bible, the, the particular name. The particular name. What, what is the name in the Ethiopic for Asher? Let's just go to chapter 6. Chapter 6, uh, verse 24. Chapter 6, here we are. Let's go to verse 24. Um, Haya Narad Yekore Le George Aser Ya Aser Hilkana Ab Yasaf Nacho Ab Yasaf Ab Yasaf Nacho. So the sons of Kor were Aser Hilkana and Ab Yasaf. Av Yasaf, all right? Okay, so it's a se re a se re So if we were to spell it out right here, we have a se re Now we can, uh, this would be, this would be a, a, a A sound, almost like Asher. Remember, there's Asher too. And also in what was said to uh, Moses in the burning bush, Ehya Shara or Asher Ehya. So this um, particular, these three letters in different contexts is interpreted in different ways within the Hebrew. We have in in Psalm Psalm um, one where it says Asher Haish, blessed is the man. Asher or happy is the man. Asher Haish. So Asher is there, but here is Asher, and Asher, according to the Hebrew, means captive, a captive or a prisoner, was a was a Levite of the priestical um, class, um, a son of Korah. Korah was one of those who headed the rebellion against Moses and Aaron. So Korah or Kore was one of those who headed the rebellion against Moses and Aaron, who denied and defied the authority of Moses as Jah's appointed, or we can even say anointed, spokesperson. Now these malcontents, that means they wasn't content, you understand, to make their wills obedient to good influences. They were discontented or they were malcontents. They were not willing. Once again, a very key word, the word will. The word will and willing. They were not willing. They were unwilling to acknowledge, to act on the knowledge of the positions of Moses and Aaron as above their own. They didn't want to recognize that the position of Moses and Aaron was above theirs. Now, this seems to indicate, since they 
came out of Egypt, right, and since they were intruding into the priesthood, this particularly Korah, Datan, and Abira, that in ancient Egypt, perhaps, they had a higher state. You know, they were on a higher level than Moses. After all, Moses was, um, he was considered to be a fugitive. Remember, Moses ran because um, of the killing of the Egyptian because of one of his Hebrew brethren. And we don't know exactly who this particular Hebrew was. So perhaps there's something, there's some background story, you know, there's some background story too to this as well. But what's obvious is that they were not willing to acknowledge the position or the authority of Moses and Aaron as above their own. You know what I'm saying? Mixed up moods and attitudes, in other words. The same sort of situations that, that we are striving to overcome even right now, even with the Ethiopian World Federation as well. But, but they thought, right, they thought that they could fill the places of leadership and high priesthood just as rightly and capably as did those whom God, Ha Elohim, Jah, if you please, had chosen for these places. And then it has in parentheses, Numbers 16, close parentheses, period. So this is also speaking about this very same chapter. Right, and giving us an overview. Now, the overview is that Korah, he was one of those who headed the rebellion. The rebellion was against Moses and Aaron. That these, Korah, Datan, Abiram, they were malcontent and they were not willing, they were unwilling to make their wills obedient to the good influence of Jah and all the signs, everything that they had seen. They were not willing to acknowledge the position or the authority of Moses and Aaron as being above their own, but they thought, they presumed, or they presumed, right, they presumed in themselves that they could um, fill the places of leadership, that they could be leaders in this as well. And, and we have these same things going on even to, especially today. That's why this is so important for us to understand the, 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 the practical application, even for us, so we can learn from others than our own bitter mistakes. Here it says that they, they thought they could fill the places of leadership and high priesthood just as rightly and capably as did those whom Ha Elohim or Yah, Jah, God, had chosen for these places. So God, the true and living God, had chosen then and even in this present time has chosen today for certain places of leadership as well as high priestly or priestical functions within the, the church, the Rastafari church amongst I and I, as well as within the government, we can say, Le Misale, for example, the Ethiopian World Federation. However, we have these same sort of, um, of uh, mixed up moods and attitudes and, and, and bad will, you understand, because they were not willing to submit themselves Instead, they presumed that they could do the same thing, right? Numbers chapter 16. Now, Korah, Korah and the others who rebelled, they were rebels, they were lawless with him, and their families, get this, and their families, they were destroyed, they were downstroyed, they were, they perished. How did they perish? How did Korah, right, and the other rebels and their families, how did they perish? Well, according to Orit Zehulkwe, or according to the Midbar, the book of Numbers, the Hebrew book of Numbers, they perished, they were destroyed by the earth, by the earth, opening her mouth beneath them and swallowing them up. Now, some would say, wow, this really seems on a certain level, what, mythological, fantastic? What you mean that this does not happen and in reality this cannot? Well, we know that it can, but this is interesting on, on more ways than one, especially this is all connected with Asir. Remember, they said to go see Asir. Now, Asir was the son of Korah, 
was a son of Korah. And this name out of Egypt, from Egypt, would have been Osar, or in the Greek, Osiris. So this kind of shows also that there was a competing priesthood. There was a competing priesthood even in the wilderness and in this particular wilderness scene here in Numbers chapter 16. But is there more? Well, of course there is. There is more. Now, what more? Let's look at this metaphysically. Metaphysically, Moses, Moshe, Musa, and Musa Bamarinya in Amharic means from the ancient Gutas, it's a title actually. Musa is the head of a fraternal order. In other words, if you were in a fraternity in ancient times, in ancient Ethiopia, in ancient times, um, the one who was the head of that fraternity would be the Musa. The Musa will be the head of the, like the big brother, or the head of the fraternity will be the Musa. So Musa, or Moses, he represents what? He represents the divine law, the Melakotawi Hug. And what does Aaron, what does Aaron represent? Aaron represents the executive power of divine law of the Melakotawi Hug. Now this 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 point right here this could be a whole a whole um a lecture in itself just just what we read right here to really understand it both in its context as well as in its application today. Now remember Christ sent them forward two by two. So we have Moses here. He represents what? Moses represents divine law because in Egypt Moses was to be a god, a netter a netter or the netteru, a netter to Pharaoh. He was to be a god or an Elohim to Pharaoh in Pharaoh's own Egyptian system of things. So Jah was saying, in that system of things, Moses is divine. Moses is a god. I will make Moses a god, a netter to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh. Now what about Aaron? The Bible says that Aaron, Aaron was his prophet. So Yah, Jah would speak to Moses, and Moses would communicate this message to Aaron, and Aaron would speak that to Pharaoh and to speak that to the court. Now, Aaron, he represents the executive power. This is interesting. The executive power. He represents the executive power of the divine law. He is the executor. He is the executor. It's like, um, in a sense, it would be like um, Moses was like God, right? And Aaron was almost like the king, or Moses was like the king, and Aaron was like the prime minister, in that sense. And, and, and see, it's important to understand it because the, the whole system of government, even in the West, grows out of the Europeans' understanding and somewhat application of this common law, which is biblical law, which goes back to our other ancestors, the black nobility in the European countries, which civilized Europe. So the same law that we're dealing with today is all connected with yesterday. So that's important to really understand that right there. Now, Korah. Korah springs from love. Korah himself, he comes from love. The other day, I was reasoning with a sister, one of I and I Ethiopian World Federation, you could say members, one who's part of this, but within uh, uh, another um, region of the world. And it was interesting because we were just talking, and, and she said that all this confusion that's going on right now, even in some of the administration here and there within the Federation, can be worked out in love. I felt it important, really, there was the inspiration that, that came to me that made me feel that it was important for me to remind her that in jaw love, some will say that love will work it out. You understand? But love needs a protector, and, ja, and love also needs to be true because, remember, there's all kind of love. You see, when the Bible says that God is love, it does not mean that love is God. You see, that, that, that's reverse engineering it. 
You can't do that with, with the divine. You can't reverse engineer the divine. God, Jah, is love. It does not mean that love is God because it's all kind of love. Some people love to lie. They love to steal. They love to do all kind of crazy stuff. That has nothing to do with Jah. So we have to qualify that love by, by who possesses that love that will unite us. It's Jah's love. Now what's interesting is that this particular portion right here connected with Korach, also connected with Levi, when we understand this metaphysically, according to the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, that Korah, he springs from love, when you in interpret the name. He springs from Lewi, which represents divine love. Literally, Lewi, Levi, means joining. But that is the idea of, of love, when two sevens clash, as it were. As do Moses and Aaron. So Moses, Aaron, and Korah, they all spring from Jah's love. They all spring from Levi or Lewi. So it's not like they are different. They, they, they are kinfolk. They are relative. They, we can even say they are family. But now the family is getting really big here, right? So Moses, Aaron, Levi, you understand? Moses, Aaron spring from um, love, and so does Korah. But Korah, but Korah means ball. Kor means ball. Kor means ice. Very interesting. Bald in the sense of barren. You see, in ancient times, if they saw, like if you look at Africa, some parts of Africa now, and some parts of Africa where the desert is, where there's no green, there's no trees, that was what the ancient people would have considered bald. In other words, we might say bald in another context today, and Rastafari also uses the bald head idea. But that bald head idea has been misunderstood by many of the youths. They think it means you see some of a bald head. It goes a little bit deeper than that, metaphysically, spiritually. But Korah means bald ice, bald and ice. Now, this infers the opposite of love. So the name Korah, in its Hebrew interpretive here, means bald and ice, and it infers the opposite of love. Not the same as love, but the opposite or contrary to love. A state in which one, the, the, the individual, is cold. You understand? Is unproductive in life. Is unproductive in good. Is cold in the sense of goodness. It's like when the Bible says that they are wise to do evil, but don't know how to do good. It is easy for them to do evil. They're wise at, at bad and evil and corruption. You know what I'm saying? But they find it so hard to do that which is good and be productive in the good and be productive in life and, 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 and warm, you know what I'm saying, or hot rather, hot. They're cold to jaw life. Therefore, they're also cold to jaw love. Because of what? Because of unwillingness. Here, see, so that, that will keeps coming up. So we can call this almost a lesson in what happens when you do not make your wills obedient to good influences. This particular section, this particular teaching right here is what happens when you don't make your will obedient to good influences as our father, Abu Kadus, Ketamawi, Haile Shilase teaches. Because of unwillingness to be guided in one's love, faculty, and that faculty within, in, in their own internal tree of life, in the love faculty to be guided by the law, to be guided by the law of God. Now, in a New Testament sense, that would be guided by the Spirit of God. Because once you're guided by the Spirit of God, it's in keeping with the law of God. Now, see, this is what, what, what we... What we um, what we get, what we have opportunity to receive through Yeshua HaMoshiach. Very, very important to make that connection because we know that Korah, in another way of interpreting it, is the, the mind of flesh. So when Rastafari originally said um, bald head, many people thought the bald head was just as somebody didn't have any hair on their head. It goes much deeper than that, people. Though on the outer level, you can see, you can interpret that on the outer level. 
but in spirit and in truth, it goes much deeper than that. This is love expressing personality. This is love that expresses personality. And it brings forth Asir. It brings forth the captive. It brings forth the prisoner who represents a bond edge. Bondage. Remember, they came out the house of bondage, but the house of bondage did not come out of them. And this is what Korah represents right here. So here, with the, with the love expressing in personality, the coming forth of the captive, or Asir, who represents bondage, generation, sorrow, and death. Isn't this the Osiris kind of character? If you can understand now the Hebraic understanding of the ancient Egyptian mysteries, that Osiris, right, or the Asir, the captive, the prisoner, was bound. Remember how he was bound, shut up in that coffin? You know what I'm saying? He was bound. Even when you see the Osiris, he is wrapped around in, in the bandages, right? He represents generation, the whole idea of Haru and the chosen coming forth from him. It represents sorrow, the sorrow of Osset, the sorrow at what happened with, with the fracticide, brother killing brother, right? Um, as well as death. Even the whole idea of Osiris really is connected with death. So we have this fourfold, this fourfold meaning to be found in Asir in addition to captive and prisoner, bondage, generation, sorrow, and death. Now, in generation, you can have regeneration or you can have degeneration. Let's just note that right there. Now, love, rather, Jah's love, in its divine purity, is the key to life. Some will say Jah's love is the key to life. No, Jah's love in its divine purity, or love in its divine purity, is Jah's love. And that is the key to life. Harmony and peace. The key to what? Life, harmony, and peace. But when love is exercised in the selfishness of personal consciousness, it leads one into bondage. In other words, when we exercise and if we exercise our love in selfishness, in just doing what we will instead of seeking John's will, right, in the personal consciousness, this leads us into that bondage, right? Leads us into bondage, spiritual bondage, and makes one a prisoner to sense. Makes one a prisoner to sense. Now, since we're here talking about Osar, Asir, and Osiris, we just will go into this. Osiris, how did Osiris, according to ancient Egyptians, how did he end up in that position? Oh, it was his big bad brother who, who basically was jealous of him and wanted the throne, so he made a banquet and, and he measured how, you know, he measured Osiris, his, 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 his height and so forth and so on, and he had a, a tomb or sarcophagus, according to one legend, right? And he says, whoever can fit this, Seti, Sut, Sutan, the Typhonian, said, whoever can fit this right here, you know, it belongs to them. Now, if you notice something for a moment, if you go to the, the fuller story of what happened at that particular party, I think it was a party or something like that, that Sutan or Sait or Satan or Seti, Egyptian Seth, Sut, right, had for his brother Osiris. There was beer, there was drinking, and some of the ancient um, Egyptian um, um, papyrus and stories of, of Osiris say that Osiris had, he, he was drunk. You could blame it on the uh, 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 alcohol, that he was, he was drunk, and then when he saw this particular sarcophagus with all the gold and everything, it was, it was, it was you know, sense. Remember? sense. He really didn't, he almost lost his wits. Almost like that's why we have in the Proverbs that wine is a marker, right? That wine is a marker. And, and strong drink, you understand? Strong drink is also deceptive and very dangerous as well. So 
even how Osiris got himself in the predicament that he did. That's not saying that was right what Sutan did or Satan or Seti. It was not right. But let's understand how he got in that bondage position and also that bound position and look at the link to a seer. In fact, think about the whole story of Osiris for a moment. And this, this will be the, the Hebrew Osiris. We're going to call this part the Hebrew Osiris because this is, this is like tales from the Duat right here in our Bibles. You know what I'm saying? Which kind of shows now, well, here's what the Egyptian mythology says. But now here we have this people, the Hebrews, who were also um, socialized in that same worldview, but had a different interpretation of certain key elements um, from, the, from the, we could say, from the popular version. Like today there's a popular version of Christianity that the people who came to America 400 years ago for religious reasons, they would not recognize this so-called popular version of Christianity. They, would, they probably wouldn't even recognize these people as being Christians, especially if you recognize all the stuff that's going on nowadays. But it's interesting how the connection of Osar or Asir, Osiris, and what it says right here about when love is exercised in selfishness of the personal consciousness. Because this is what Sutan did with Osiris. He appealed to Osiris, 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 Osiris vanity. He got him drunk. You know what I'm saying? Made a big party in his honor, blah, 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 so forth and so on. And this led Osiris to make bad, poor judgments. You understand? That led to his bondage, that led to, to the degeneration, you understand? Sorrow and death, right? And it makes one a prisoner to sense. You understand? To sense. In other words, his five senses gravitated himself to that trap that was, led, that, that was laid by his um, evil, we could say by his evil, um, brother, Sutan, or Satan, or Sheti, right? Thus, one becomes what? Swallowed up. One becomes swallowed up in the earthly life, in sensuality and materiality. This is one of the lessons that um, even many of the Egyptologists and those who are all into Egypt, Egypt don't even recognize about Osiris, you understand? Osiris so much wasn't so much praised. Osiris was lamented. This is, this, is, this is kind of interesting when you really think about it. You know, think of the story is telling us a lot, but what's happening is that people are not, they have not found the truth for themselves. So they say, oh, Osiris was the god, so forth and so on. The, the god of what? He was the god of the underworld. Now, where did Korach go? Where did Korach, Kore? And, and his fellow rebels and his family went. The ground opened up and swallowed them up, and in some interpretations, it swallowed them up alive. They went down to the underworld alive. And even much the language in the Hebrew is very much similar to the language in ancient Egypt concerning this, this mythology, this worldview. So we can see that that. What we have in the Bible is not really different from what was going on in Egypt, you know what I'm saying, or even in other parts of the world, but it was a different interpretation of these basic elementals. So you see we have Osiris here, which is Latter-day, Greco-European. We have Osar, which some say would be a more correct translation uh, or transliteration of it. But the Bible has Asir, and Asir links directly with Korah, right, or Kore, or Korah in Jude 11, which is the main matter in this Rastafari sabbatical study number 38, or this Torah portion, right? So when one becomes swallowed up in earthly life, they get swallowed up in sensuality and sense, right? 
and they get swallowed up in materiality. You see how this, this once again links to Kora, the mind of the flesh? Don't you see that mind of the flesh link? There's that very apparent mind of the flesh. Now, I'm not sure. I didn't read this. I read this before, but I didn't read this for this particular portion. So I'm going to go here right now with you as well. Let's just go to the New Testament, the Hadith Kidan, Romans 13. Let's go to Romans chapter 13, uh, which is in, in our Torah portion, reading and feeding. You understand to read the whole, you know, all of, you know, the New Testament, the New Testament reading. We're here, but we're going to go over here, all right? We're going to go over here, Numbers 13, 1 to 7. So let's go to Romans chapter 13, 1 to 7 for a moment, all right? So it's interesting, isn't it? Isn't this very interesting? A seer. Osiris, right? And then what the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary explains concerning the name, which is the real Kabbalah. That's the, you, you really want to know about Kabbalah? Don't get all caught up in all that other stuff. Learn the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary and the application and the story and the fullness of the understanding. And that right there is the true Kabbalah of Christ, not, not of, of Korah. Remember, Korah was an Edomite too. It was of Esau, the link. The link of Esau is very clear there as well, which once again connects us with the mind of the flesh, with the Jews who call themselves Jews and are not but a synagogue of Satan. That's the other link right there. Then in Revelation 3 and 9, it says that he will make those of the synagogue of Satan bow to the true ones and know that I have loved you. You understand because you are the ones he has said he has chosen, set his love on them. But here it says in Romans chapter 13. Now this is many people say this is what the government want the preachers to be preaching to people, right? So that they obey the government and blah blah so forth and so on. But let's read it for ourselves. Romans chapter 13. It says, "Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God." The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, here's what's so very interesting. Most people take this right here, right? And they would say, well, this is saying to submit to any kind of temporal worldly ruler because it's saying that if you have somebody ruling over you, that they have been put there by God. But they, they, they are totally misreading this. It says, let every soul, let every soul, you understand? Know be subject to the higher powers, to the spiritual power. For there is no power, you understand? Know there is no power, authority, or deutimus, but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Isn't this the case of Korah? Right? Isn't this the case of Korah? Because Korah and uh, Datan, Abiram, and many others, they, they felt that they can do the priestly thing too, that they can be the executive, that they can be like the Israelite international president, so to speak. They felt that they could do those things. They felt that they were in the same league as, as Moses and Aaron, but they was not. For rulers are not a terror to good works. But then we learn in Korah in the meaning of the name that there's a certain coldness, there's a certain unproductiveness, so there's basically no good work. But to the evil, but to the evil. In other words, Moses was not a tyrant, but they made Moses out to be a tyrant. See, this is all part of their revolution, almost similar to what happened in Ethiopia, 1974, in the same sense. Wilt thou not be afraid of the power of the higher? Do that which is good. Do good. Do good. The bingy drum. Do good. Do good. Do good. And thou shalt have praise. So you shall have miskana of the same. Of, of, of what, what same? Of those who do good. See, so that tells us that we're not going to have praise of those who do evil. Those who do evil, we're a terror to them. Because rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil work. Verse 4, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. Now, what's so interesting here is that 
people say, well, this is the part in the Bible that they don't, some people don't like because some people have the, the prophets of Balaam, those who have the spirit of Cain, Balaam, Korah, or CBC spirit, the false, the, you know, the, 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 the false trinity. They have this false trinity spirit. They teach this as though this is why you have to obey um, human temporal governmental people. You know, that's why they have a lot of preachers going to preach this to people when there's a martial law or something like that. So listen to, you know, listen to your voted um, representative. But it's not talking about them. It's not even talking about them. It's saying, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. Most of these elected officials question whether there is a God. Yet you and we'll leave that right there. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. What is the sword of the minister of God? What is the sword? You understand? Honestly, what is the sword of the minister of God? The sword of the minister of God is the B-I-B-L-E, is the word of God. That's the sword of the minister of God. Ephesians will, will, will show you that and else, elsewhere as well. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath, wrath, to be rotted, right, rotted upon him that doeth evil. You understand that do with evil. But see, most of the preachers and pastors, though they might call themselves ministers of God, they're like, they're like Korah. You understand? And they, they're, they're connected to this, this false trinity right here. Not, for, for them, Cain is the father. Uh, understand that. Remember what Christ got into with some of, the, um, some of the religious people of his time? They say, Abraham is our father, and Christ said, if Abraham was your father, you would love me. You understand? But he said, your father was a murderer from the beginning, and what? Truth didn't abide in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. Cain. Notice Cain. Cain was the first murderer. So Christ even points out, and, and this verifies that this is another way of overstanding that evil trinity that you read about in Revelation. You understand that, you know, in the little spirits that come out of the false, you know, the false prophet. Cain, Balaam, Korah. Cain, the way of Cain. The era of Balaam for a reward. Korah, the gain saying. Right? The gain saying. And we'll go a little bit deeper on this, John Willen, but let's just get through this right here. So, here in verse 5, Romans chapter 13, it says, for it says, wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath. In other words, we should be subject. We should make our wills obedient to good influence, not because there's wrath. In other words, we should do good, not because we think, oh, after death, we're going to go to hell, or we're going to go down in the pit or something like that. Not for that reason. The Bible is saying this. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject. There are needs that we have spiritual needs that if we don't be subject, you understand, we're going to be in a bad, in a, in, you know, in a bad, in a, in a bad way. You understand, um, wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. You know, when the Bible talks about that some folks, their conscience gets burnt out, that some people, their conscience gets burnt out, and, and sometimes you, uh, hopefully you don't meet anybody like this, but People have met people where you recognize this person has no conscience. It's almost like, you know, you're talking to a living dead. So this is why when we think about that verse in the Bible, we see right here where it's saying that ye must needs be subject. Make thy will obedient to good influence, not only for wrath, not only because you're afraid of God's judgment or you don't want to have God rotted on you. You understand? But for conscience sake, because the imperial majesty teaches says that anyone who suffers from a guilty conscience is never, right, is, is never at peace. You know, they can't have no peace if they suffer from a guilty conscience and he gives his, his, his teaching, you understand, which is basically the word of God about how to go and correct that in Christ. 
you understand, and through Christ, because he is the Savior of our soul. There is no other. There is no other than our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, who is the Savior of our souls. Don't believe the lies. They're lies. Seek the truth. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also. For this cause pay ye tribute. Now, some will say, oh, that tribute means to pay taxes. Well, if you're a Gentile, and according to the Gentile misunderstanding, you would think that. But you have to remember where this, where this is rooted and grounded. You understand, not from a Gentile misunderstanding. Pay ye tribute also. But even in that sense, you do so. You understand? For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. But I, I, would, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would debate that right there for a moment about paying tribute in that sense. In other words, I debate the, the, the false... Uh, application of Romans chapter 13. There's a false application of Romans chapter 13 which the devil has been able to tweak very successfully until even many who do have faith in God, when they read that part, they think that it means um, abiding by um, Gentile world rulers and it's not even talking anything about that because was Moses a Gentile? Notice the connection with this Torah portion even in our Torah portion readings, as if you read all of the readings from Old Testament to the prophets and the New Testament, we're in Romans chapter 13, 1 to 7. So I want to take a look at verse 6. I want to take a, a, a look at verse 6 right here. And verse 6 right here says, Silizi degmo tegeber ra la Therefore we, you could say pay, you could say tribute, pay taxes, in a sense, but really the root of tegebra lachu huna, gebra means to work. It, it almost means, relates to farm like um, um, gebra. The gebra is a, is a farmer, but it really comes from the good is to work. You understand? Now, from that work, there are so called taxes, but what's interesting in this connection, in this particular Torah portion from Numbers chapter 16 to Numbers chapter 1832, the last portion of this reading, the last part of this reading is dealing with the duties of the priest and it touches on tithes. The, the proper use of tithes and the proper way to give tithes, not like these Balaam prosperity pimps of the contemptible gospel, you understand, falsely preach and teach, not like the apostate teachers teach and preach, right? It says, Let us let me gabal kabrin situ. And now in the English, you probably have heard this before, no doubt. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear or reverence to whom fear or reverence is due, and honor to whom honor is due. That is the perfect New Testament um, reading to close out the, the, this particular sabbatical study as far as when you are, you know, within your house or whether alone or whether in community, when you go through the sabbatical reading and feeding, that is a perfect verse to, to um, close on. And, yes, and, and, and as, as you can see in our... Um, yes, Samen Tawi Sen Bet or which can be downloaded for, for free from our website. We have the Old Testament Torah reading first, the Naveen, the prophetical, what the other Jews call the Haftarah, we call the Nabeen, you know, the Nabiyat in Bamarinya. Uh, uh, in Hebrew, it's Naveen. They put a V, but it really is a B, Nabeen. But the prophetical, the second, 
uh, 1 Samuel 11 and 14 to Samuel 12 and 22. We didn't touch on that as of yet, but please, in your own um, in your own sabbatical, you know, study, remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy, don't forget to, to, to read that part. We're just teaching on this right here, giving an overview for this particular sabbatical portion and, and strengthening ourselves, our hearts and our minds, and our bodies and our souls, our souls and our bodies, because the, the spirit strengthens the soul and the soul strengthens the body. So if we feel weak, we have to trace it back to the soul and then that to the spirit. But in that equation, Christos Yeshua, you know what I'm saying, is essential. It's one on one. It's the main. It's the main matter. You know saying what this is all about. You read the Bible. You think you have eternal life, and all that you're reading about is our Black Lord and Savior Yeshua Hamashiach. You know saying we read this Bible. You think every but it's testifying of Yeshua Hamashiach. So here in this particular portion right here, it is interesting when we connect it now properly. Romans chapter 13 is basically, once again, dealing with Korah. It's dealing with the fact that they had no honor, that they were dishonorable, that they, uh, that they encroached into the priestical office, that they, they actually were saying that they knew better what was for the Beta Israel than God, than Jah. Similar Unfortunately, sadly, but this is, this is what we're testifying to, what we've seen in certain areas of Rastafari, of activity. You understand? I have to point to the Federation, the Ethiopian War Federation. It's the same thing. They think they know better, you understand, than whom Jah has chosen. You understand? For, for what responsibility and for what calling and for what place and for what position. They think that in Jah's, in God's, in God's order, that democracy is like democracy in the world. You see? See, Jah's people is the demos, is the people. But see, when the people now start choosing their own different wills, this is where you have the confusion. You understand? That's why we have to be rooted and grounded in I and I divine heritage. Now, I know I went a little bit away from the Osiris part right there, but it was summing up once again, you understand, once again, the main point, and that is this 38th Torah portion, reading and feeding on Korah.